it's seventy one. So I'll just wait for a couple more people. You can see that it looks like seventy so far. Um, Right, so let's get started. Um, welcome to Graham's Port Single Harvest Tawny Tasting. Um, I'm Tom Simmington, fifth generation member of the Simmington family. Um, and tonight we'll be tasting a, a, an absolutely fantastic range of single harvest tawnies uh, from 1963 to 1994, so almost 40 years of single harvest uh, tawnies. Um, we'll be tasting with fourth generation uh, member and our head winemaker, my uncle Charles Simington. Um, I'm very excited to be pre pre presenting these, these wines tonight with Charles because uh, it's actually one of the best sort of wine lineups that I think I've ever, ever tasted. Um, so before we get started and get to the interesting bit and hear what Charles has to say about the wines uh, and also taste them, I just want to say a couple of thank yous and introduce our, our, our family uh, and, and Graham Sport. Uh, so thank you to the, the Vintage Wine and Port team for coordinating this. Uh, I know a lot of work has gone into it and uh, we actually spoke to a couple of the, the team earlier today. They're very nice people. We actually discovered that this is Vintage Wine and Port's first fully recyclable tasting. So that's a bit of a, uh, a cool record there. Even the shipping labels were recycled. So. Uh, guys, keep your bottles. They make be they're beautiful, uh, really aesthetic uh, little bottles. So you can keep them as trinkets or, or please recycle them. Uh, before I let Charles get started, I'll just tell you a little bit about um, our family. Uh, our family st story starts with Andrew James uh, Symington, a young Scotsman who left uh, Scotland at the age of 18 uh, on a ship. He arrived on the banks of Porto and fell in love with the city uh, and, and the industry. He started working for the Graham's family uh, before becoming a partner at Dow's Port and eventually joining forces with the War family, War's Port. Um, his sons joined him in the business after the war um, and today there are uh, 11 of us in the business. Uh, so it was only in the 70s, 1970, in which our, our family acquired uh, Graham's port. So it's almost quite a nice 100-year loop in which Andrew James first started working to when my, my grandfather's generation, Charles's father's generation, uh, acquired the uh, port house. So today there are 11 of us working in the business in almost every aspect, uh, from production to marketing, and we are the leading producer of premium port wines in the Dury. Uh, we are also a, uh, a certified B Corp, which is a, a strict protocol we follow um, on environmental, so social and cultural impact and responsibility, constantly striving uh, to improve. Um, the Graham family were long established merchants in, in Portugal and, and in, in India. Uh, they accepted a debt in uh, 11 pipes of port um, in 1815 and loved the idea of trading uh, and shipping top quality ports. So in 1815, Graham's port was established by William and John uh, Graham. Uh, it was around uh, 60 years later, uh, sorry, 70 years later in 1890, where they were amongst the first port houses to invest in the vineyard in the Dury, uh, acquiring. Uh, Quinto dos Malverdos, which is Graham's flagship uh, estate uh, today. Uh, simultaneously, they built in 1890 the current 1890 uh, Graham's Lodge, where all of these wines have aged and where all of our uh, tawny ports aged uh, today in Villa Nova de Gaia. Um, so, Charles Simington, our head winemaker, uh, has nurtured these wines for almost 26 years now. Uh, he's selected all of these single harvest tawny ports uh, for release. So what a better person to be tasting them with and hearing from. Uh, Charles, you probably won't like me saying, but you're amongst <clears throat> the most awarded winemakers in the world uh, with over 40 wines, I think, um, with, with scores above 95 in Wine Spectator. Um, you started in the company in 1995 and have been responsible for a number of major innovations um, 
not least the robotic lagar, monograph for palm planting and many others. So we're all incredibly excited to, to taste these wines with you and I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Tom, and uh, welcome to what is a fantastic tasting. I've done many tastings over the years. It's not often um, I can remember having done a tasting of so many great wines um, in one sitting, but it is really a fantastic opportunity to understand and to appreciate some of the lovely wines that come out of the dairy um, and have been aged here in Gaia. Um, so I hope you've all got uh, five glasses in front of you with the wines board. Um, so that you can look at them side by side and hopefully um, contain yourselves so that you can go back and forth a little bit, which would be useful as, a as the tasting progresses. Um, one of the things that's fantastic about these wines is the intensity of the aroma. And I suspect that all of you may be in different places, but there's one thing in common that I am sure of, which is that the room that you're, you're in will have this fantastic scent of the lovely old book this just fills a room like a perfume. It is a fantastically intense and powerful wines uh, giving off these aromas. Um, I will just ask you, however, to hold back just a little bit longer before we get into the tasting itself so that I can tell you a little bit about port generally and how, where these wines sit in terms of style um, in, in, in the port category overall. Um, so th th these, these wines we're seeing today are called single harvest um, ports. They're from the one year and they've been aged in wood. Uh, they probably represent about 1%, of, if that, of all port sales. So it is a very small niche category of a very high standard of wine. They've been very carefully selected um, and they are really very special. Um, <clears throat> one of the things also about these wines, which has made them particular, particularly popular in the last few years is that they are, in fact, extremely user-friendly. Um, whereas other, other wines may need decanting, um, they need to be opened when they're at the right time uh, to be drunk, and often it's difficult to gauge whether they are or not. These wines are bottled, uh, ready for drinking, um, and, um, and require no decanting, uh, a, a simple amount of uh, a little light chilling before before drinking is often a good thing. But other than that, all you have to do is pull the bar top cork. You don't even need a cork screw. So you know um, how how easy does it get? And so you have a guarantee that you're going to be drinking a really fantastic wine, a fantastic old wine, and it's absolute prime, um, which is something that's not necessarily uh, available in many categories of wine. So. Just to go over a little bit generally on port. Um, port is a fortified wine made in the Douro Valley in northern Portugal. And after it's been made inland um, from a porto, it's brought down uh, to, to the place called Gaia, which is a city just in front of Porto, where traditionally port has been aged. And it's aged here because it's cooler and the humidity is higher, being a, um, a, a better location in the Douro, which is um, extremely hot and dry. So within the port category, there are two big families uh, of wines. There are the fruit-driven ruby, reserve ruby, and LBV type wines. And then there's another big family, which is the tawny type wines, which is normally made up of 10-year-old tawnies, 20-year-old tawnies, 30-year-old tawnies, and these single harvest wines from specific years. So these two big families make up probably 95% of all port produced. Um, and all these wines are aged in wood. Then the other 5% is a, very, is a small but very well-known category, which is vintage port. And vintage port is aged in bottle and not in wood. So the big difference between um, these wines that we're tasting here today um, is, the, is that these wines are from a single year but they've been aged in wood throughout all their lives. They've had an oxidative um, uh, aging process, which brings around secondary uh, characteristics in terms of aromas, uh, aromas associated to aging um, and oxidation. Whereas vintage port is not aged, uh, or is it aged in wood for a very short 
then bottled and it will age in bottle um, until it, you, you choose to drink it really. Um, and, it, and vintage port can actually be fantastic when it's very young, but also very much worth waiting for. It can be aged for anything from 20 to 80 years, um, depending on the wine. So vintage port um, being aged in a bottle is aged without air. And so the wine maintains its fruit driven characteristics for a much longer period of time. It's a much slower aging process, uh, which tends to um, bring out the fruit characteristics of the wine. Whereas these, these wines we're looking at today have been aged in wood and therefore um, have much more of secondary characteristics, which we'll see um, clearly as we go through the wines today. So a very quick sort of idea of the different styles of wines, but just to really place you um, where we are. And now the fun begins. So um, on to the first wine. And um, we, are, we are really spoiled today because this first wine from 1994 is one of probably four of the greatest vintages of the last century. So in the last century, 1927, 1945, 1963, and 1994 are probably the four most recognized vintages of the century. And we're fortunate enough to have today, two of those here today. So um, we are on for a treat. Um, having said that, these wines, um, all of them were made before I started working at the company, and I feel like I've been here for a very long time. So um, it just shows uh, these wines um, are really quite old. And just to get a little bit of perspective on, on the historic side, uh, 1994, um, other than the year that Tom was born, so that, that does actually show just how old it really is, um, no, uh, is also the year in which um, Nelson Mandela was made president of South Africa and the year in which the channel, channel Tunnel was opened. So we are looking quite a long way back now. And um, so it was th this wine would have been produced from the property that Tom mentioned earlier, um, Quinta de Malverde, the Graham's property um, in the Dura and the Sima uh, located in a south-facing location. In 94, we had some fantastic um, weather conditions, really classic. Uh, conditions uh, with a bit of rain before the harvest, uh, pretty low yields um, due to mainly uh, flowering conditions not having been great. Um, and um, the notes I have here actually of my cousin James, uh, who was at uh, Malvid at the time, said the quality of wines produced appears to be exceptionally high. So even during the vintage, it was quite obvious to, I think, most of the people involved, that we were making something very special. So let's have a look at wine. This wine, the first thing that's interesting is that you'll notice that it's actually considerably darker than the, than the next three wines, even though it's quite a lot younger. And that just shows the, the type of structure and, and, and this and quality this wine has right from the start. So this, this wine would be made by my father. I, I, I can remember selecting this wine um, for aging for Pugeta um, uh, shortly after I'd started working in 95. We would normally start selecting the wines that will be um, for uh, timber harvest aging, normally about six to seven years after the harvest, um, when we've had the opportunity to assess its capacity to age in in, um, in wood. So this wine has a lovely sort of rose petal nose, a bit of oriental spice, toasted honey, it's got some balsamic dried fig aromas coming through, Lay layers of fruit, incredibly intense, lovely, lovely aromas, very clean. For me, I thought that this, uh, the 1994, I don't know about you, Charles, but for me, it, it seems almost quite fresh for, for a wine, I suppose as old as I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it seems like it's still got, I, I don't know, I, I would have expected maybe a little bit less fruit, but 
it really um, it stands stands out there. Without a doubt, it's still it's probably it's probably the only wine we'll be tasting tonight. It's still showing fruit characteristics of the vintage itself. It's still got primary some primary fruit coming through. It's got this um, blue and blackberry flavours on the mouth in the mouth. So sort of toasted coffee uh, flavours, um, and and it's just very long. It's in, the the flavour persists for, for for quite a considerable period of time. It, in fact, it just goes on and on. So, I think I'll probably move on to the 1990 now, and um, the. Um, these wines have been aged in wood, but it's interesting to note that um, the wood that we use for aging port is wood that's known as seasoned oak. It's, it's wood that's been used for wines previous to the introduction of the wines that we're tasting today. That because these wines are aging in wood for so long that um, new wood is actually quite aggressive and it can, um, it can basically become too overpowering and wines becoming too too um too too wood flavored and dominated by wood so by using seasoned oak we uh, are able to adapt uh, or to, to introduce wood flavors slowly over what is an exceptionally long aging process besides that we also have the opportunity to um, age these wines in large wooden vats, normally at the beginning of the aging process, so up to seven, eight years old. They may be uh, held in vats that can be 20 to 30,000 litre vats. Um, and then the wine uh, will normally be transferred into casks. So as I said earlier, these are 550 litre barrels, which is the classic size of a port barrel. Um, and where it would then age um, uh, for, for until the time when it comes to to being to being bottled. So this wine is already thirty one years old. Um, just to give you again some historic uh, theme, it's um, it's a that was the year in which the Berlin Wall was brought down. And Germany was reunited, and in fact, the year in which Margaret Thatcher resigned after the infamous poll tax. So, again, gives you just a, uh, an idea of how long ago that was. And um, this was actually an unusual year, ninety, because it was a year which is extremely large. Uh, it was a year that yielded a lot and produced wines of excellent quality. So, in that respect, it was um, quite an anomaly. Um, normally, we would expect years uh, of that sort of size to, to be uh, not as concentrated, as powerful as this wine is. Um, although this wine, I think of the wines that's here today, is definitely the more elegant wine here. It's got fantastic uh, finesse on the nose. Um, it's got this sort of apricot aroma that comes through. Um, it's a little bit quieter, perhaps, than some of the others. Um, this wine on the palate is uh, has got very much sort of caramel uh, mouth uh, flavors with sort of uh, honey and um, and it's actually very harmonious. I, I like. I think this wine is extremely um, well integrated and, and drinking very very nicely. Tom, Absolutely. Isn't? Yeah, I just wanted to, to follow on from a point that you were, you were talking about the seasoned casks, and I just wanted to highlight the cooperage that goes into, uh, into the tawnies is a really important part of, of tawny production, I suppose. Um, it's, a, it's a very sort of difficult job. I, in fact, have managed to get an opportunity to join a coopering team in Australia, um, and I never expected how, how hard and tough uh, cooperage is and it's a, it's definitely an art that has been passed down through through generations it's evolved over thousands of years uh, and Graham's port or, or uh, the Simitans we're, we're one of the last uh, port houses to still uh, cooper our own uh, barrels so we still have our own cooperage and I think it's an art in itself um, 
to 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 look after those bands. I'm sure Charles, you know how much work goes in in into that. Um, and I'll just say one other point. When I was in Australia making uh, these barrels, I was working with a fantastic team, uh, all of which made about 12 barrels over the course of the day. And I, um, very sort of quite hard work and sweating by the end of the day, had only made one. So just to show you how difficult it really is, it's um, it's, it's a difficult art. Actually, just another, I thought, interesting um, historical note on, on this, uh, on the 1990, when I was reading through some notes on this year, um, I noticed that they were talking about the scooters. Uh, I hadn't heard of the scooters for a long time, actually. I'd almost forgotten all about them. And how in 1990, they, they valued 15%, which was rather, um, <laughs> makes business quite difficult when your money's devaluing at that level uh, per year. But um, certainly worth it, considering what we have in our glass today. Right, well, so we'll probably move on to the 82, and we're now moving really into wines that are very, very old. Um, this wine um, is 39 years old, and this wine is more than likely to have been made almost entirely underfoot. So it would have been trodden in the Lagarde um, back in the back in those days. Uh, the best wines were still largely made in Lagarde often in small properties spread around the Derry Valley. Uh, in this case, it would have been made at the Marvitz Winery in the Lagarde. And um, this, um, this is a time-honored manner of making port, and it has been a way of extracting um, color in a very short period of time. Uh, so the port fermentation, uh, ports being fortified wines, are wines that only ferment half of the sugar into alcohol. So halfway through the, um, the fermentation, the fermentation is interrupted by adding brandy to the wine. And the wine so will produce around 6-7% of natural alcohol. And then the remaining alcohol that brings this wine up to 20% is brandy that's added to the must that's fermenting and stops the fermentation. So we need in a very short period of time, and, and we're looking at a fermentation that's no more than three days at most. And in those three days, we need to extract structure and color um, from our ferments to ensure that we have wines for aging for this length of time. So um, the Lagarde system of the treading, um, which we later um, automated uh, to a point, although we still do make a lot of wine trodden underfoot in the classic manner, but um, you need to be able to extract structure to 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 last for this long um, in um, in in barrel or in bottle. So um, it's also I thought another interesting note on on this wine is that back in 1982, the control of temperature of fermentations uh, was really quite difficult. Cooling systems were something that were fairly rare in those days, and um, and certainly not not available in, in, in Lagarde, very small traditional wineries. And there's a note about how hot this vintage was, um, at which, uh, which what would happen in years which uh, the grapes were coming in very hot to the Lagarde and the ferments uh, produce heat, uh, the temperatures would sometimes would rise above what was the limit of the temperature that, we, that, that you can produce wine without it uh, going wrong. Um, so the wines would be run off and fortified early, and the notes made by, by my uh, cousin Paul uh, during this vintage was exactly that, that, the, um, that in some cases the, the, the ferments were getting so hot that we had to um, run off the ferments early and fortify early. Nevertheless, um, this wine actually is, is fairly sweet, but it's pretty much within what you'd expect. Um, on the um, on a historical note, the um, 1982 was the year of the Falklands War. It was also the year in which Channel Four was um, started. So we are going back quite a long time. And I found it quite amusing when I was looking at historic notes on uh, 1982 that it was also the year that corporal punishment was banned at schools. Um, <laughs> 
If I'd known that, perhaps I wouldn't have been beaten quite so often in the following few years. But anyway, <laughs> um, so that was a, an interesting point. I pity I only found out now. Um, apart from that, um, actually, this wine uh, was a wine that we launched uh, initially uh, to commemorate the birth of Cambridge. Uh, and, um, and we launched the 82 for that commemoration because it is, in fact, the birth year of um, Prince William and Princess Kate. So that was the first um, an initial booking we did on the release of this wine was in honour of that occasion. Um, Tom, have you anything you'd like to tell us about 82 in particular? Or what, sorry? Um, no, I think you can continue. With yeah, that. Continue? yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, um, this wine has got fantastic um, cinnamon sort of nutmeg aromas coming through it's very much that sort of spicy and there's some of that almond notes it's a wine that in the mouth is um it's got some lovely acidity um i think it's got a characteristic that quite often will appear in um in tawny wines which is this citric um acidity coming through giving lovely freshness and the wine with that is soft and then it's got this volume on the palate that fills the whole palate. Um, it's a real, um, it's a really uh, quite a quite a big wine actually, for, for considering just how old this wine is. Absolutely, I'm almost getting sort of soft butterscotch or even um, sort of quince and maybe some cinnamon, quite spicy. Mm. It's incredible to see how these wines. We we obviously started with the '94, but um, as these wines age in barrel, in, in the barrel they evaporate, and so they they slowly become ever more concentrated and concentrated. And even just those first three wines, we already uh, and even the the fourth there, we've already seen some serious concentration, and um, it's really becoming quite intense. Um, really fantastic. These. Okay, so if we go on to the 1974, we really are now looking at some grand old wine. Um, this this um, wines that um, that last for this long in aging are really the sort of marathon gold medal winners. I mean, it's for. For the wine, to see a wine like this, you you often forget of all the wines that didn't make it to to this uh, to this day, and and that is a very very large majority. So we're looking at really quite a rare and special wine um, that's managed to survive all these years, and not only survive but to perform after so many years of aging um, in wood, and. Um, and I think it's also just worth remembering um, that wine, as it ages, evaporates. Um, and so we would expect to lose about 1.5% of our volume of a wine um, every year. The, the amount lost in evaporation will decline as the wine gets older. But nevertheless, um, it's very likely that the wine we're looking at here today is about 50% of, of the volume that it initially had. So it's almost like an elixir, it's a, it's a concentrate, it's um, of, of the original wine that would have been um, set apart and aged um, at the beginning uh, of this process. So um, it really is, you know, uh, quite extraordinary. Uh, but, and, and, you know, the concentration and the intensity that this wine has is very largely due to, um, this 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 concentration that's taken place very gradually and very slowly um, over over many many years. So obviously, as these wines are evaporating over time, um, they need um, you know they need to be uh, taken off their lees, and the barrels need to be regularly. Um, topped up uh, to ensure that the wine is in the best condition for aging. So this is something that is, is taken you know, uh, very rigorously over, over the years and, and is, is one of the reasons why these wines are 
are in such good shape and showing so beautifully today. So, um, 1974 was a very significant year in Portugal. Um, it was uh, the year in which the dictatorship was overthrown. Um, and so I've got some uh, words here that Michael uh, Simington wrote, um, our, our great uncle. Um, he wrote um, in the har uh, sorry, following the harvest of 1974, he said, following the political upheavals of the 25th of April, many had wondered at what would be the labor to the Quinta owners and the wine purchasers relationship this vintage. And it is pleasant to report that now, uh, notwithstanding the general political tensions in Lisbon and other cities, here all has been very peaceful and many report one of the happiest vintages, uh, vintage atmospheres for many years. So quite a, quite a nice note there. And on a, on a further positive footing, he also reported um, one of the finest vintages in recent years. He said, uh, what, it is an absolute certain, what is an absolute certainty is that each and every district has produced outstandingly good wine, well above average, and the overall 1974 port wine vintage must pr prove to be one of the best for many years. Um, so despite this uh, incredible um, uh, vintage and the wines coming out, um, the family didn't, didn't decide to uh, bottle or, or, or declare a, a, a vintage. Um, due to the continuing sort of political turmoil in the country and a, a vintage campaign. Um, and so um, the, the family elected not to bottle, uh, but nonetheless, many of the year's wines were, were so good that they had the foresight to earmark them for, for cask aging, which is why we're drinking these today. Um, this, uh, this was a year that um well, this is a year that my father has often spoken about. My father would have been very much near the beginning of his career when, when he made this wine. Um, and um, it, it was, you know, uh, our family had made it through the First and Second World War. Um, and there's no doubt that in terms of uncertainty, 1974 and the Communist Revolution in Portugal um, was an exceptionally tense time um, for, for everybody. And I, I remember my father often saying that, um, you know, uh, we really just didn't know what was going to happen. So we, we said to our farmers, who we've been working with for many years, we will, um, we will make wine and um, we will receive your grapes um, and we will do the best we can um, to, to then, you know, uh, pay you. But we, we simply have no idea whether we'll still be here. Uh, in a year's time, we have no idea what the future holds. Um, things were getting very complicated. Um, and, it, and really, I think what was largely agreed was, we'll make the wine, at worst, we'll give you the wine back. You give us the grapes, at worst, we give you the wine back. And if things work out, you know, we'll, we'll settle um, uh, you know, uh, as, 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 as we can, something. So it was a very tricky time. And um, but fortunately, things all worked out. Um, one of the great things about living in Portugal is that Portuguese are generally a very passive um, people and uh, it's a fantastic place to live. And even in the time of the revolution, I think only one or possibly two people died, which is probably in itself um, a record for a revolution, I would um, So just to give a, a different um, historic uh, idea, that this was also the year... Uh, in which um, Richard Nixon resigned after the Watergate scandal. So really, again, another major uh, historic landmark that took place in, in 74. So the wine itself is, um, it shows a bit uh, the character of the wine from a particularly hot year. It's got this slightly raisiny uh, aroma coming through, some aromas of quince, um, caramel, a bit of vanilla and ginger mixed in. So quite a few layers to this wine. I mean, it's it's um, you could go on and on really. It's uh, got fantastic, that's fantastic concentration. In the mouth, it's a peppery, spicy wine um, with a bit of uh, uh, tea leaf on, on the palate. But showing really lovely, beautifully today. Um, really is. 
Okay, so I think we could probably now move on to this last point and um, the 1963 and what, what a privilege it is to, to be drinking a wine like this today. Um, and we are, we are looking at a wine now that's even older than I am, so we really are sort of in the depths. Um, but um, so 58 year old, year old wine showing fantastically well. You can see this wine actually um, has more color um, than the 74. Again, you know, um, a symbol, a sign a bit of the, of the quality of this wine initially, made from Malbec, vintage Malbec. Um, but it's interesting as well because, um, oddly enough, wines as they get older initially start to lose color, port wines. So they will get lighter with age. But there comes a moment when the amount of color dropping out of the wines starts to, to reduce very significantly um, because the wine has essentially come to a balance uh, moment in, in terms of color. And apart from that point on, then the wine, as it's, if there's this evaporation taking place every year, the wine actually, oddly enough, starts to become darker again. So the effect that we're seeing with the 63 may in part be because the initial wine was extremely structured, but it's also very likely that this wine is now starting to get into this sort of third phase of aging um, in which the wine is becoming darker with time. And if you look at the wine on the, on the rim, you almost see a slightly greenish tint. The yellow is starting to become almost green on the rim. And that, that is the sign of a really old wine. Um, so um, just to give you some historic um, context on this, so 1963 was the year in which the Beatles um, not, um, released their first album. They were, and it is, it is the year for um, civil rights um, in which Martin Luther King made his famous speech, um, I had a dream. So we're, we're going <laughs> quite a long way back. And this is a dream as well, having a while like this today. So, um, but um, it was also perhaps 1963 was, was a fantastic vintage port year as well. And it was probably um, a, a landmark year. So after the Second World War, um, Britain was um, on war rations up until about 1954. The economy was a disaster, obviously. And right across Europe, um, economically, uh, the situation was really quite difficult for a long time. And the port trade obviously suffered very considerably with this period of time. And, um, and 1963 was really the first vintage after the war um, when the, 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 the tides returned and the port trade started to gain traction. Um, there was a lot of demand for this fantastic year. And it was really, I think, the first time uh, after the end of the war, where finally um, things were starting to come right, and um, and really from '63 onwards, things really went from strength to strength. But it was definitely a turning point year and an important year for our family. A lot of families that were involved in the port trade, um, uh, unfortunately, didn't make it through to to, to this period, and um, so it was a, a defining stage in, in, in the history of port. Sorry, I put you off No, fantastic. No, I was, I was about to say exactly the same as you, that this was one of the more significant years um, following, the, following the war and uh, coming out of the Great Recession. And to have such a bountiful harvest was, was, was really a year and a vintage that people were able to buy back into port uh, and, and was, was one of the main reasons for the revival of the industry, I suppose. So um, a, pretty, a pretty significant wine. Um, so we've we've heard from Charles about all, all the uh, the wines uh, that we have to taste today. Um, we uh, we've had quite a few questions come in over the course of the tasting. So I'm just going to uh, pose a couple of them now to Charles and, and myself. I suppose uh, we've got one here. How how do you assess if the wine will uh, if the wine will age well? <laughs> well. Uh, fortunately, with these wines, um, we do have some time to actually 
decide on on the ability of a wine to, to age um, because this we we don't we are not sort of pressured to, to, to take a decision very early on um, fortunately we have stocks that allow us to um, to keep our options open for some time and really the initial phase of aging is is perhaps the most critical stage when a wine gets to a certain stage um, and it's showing characteristics where the 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 wood um, the wood aging is improving wine and creating the type of aromas that you're you're experiencing in these wines. Um, then you you basically find um, that the wines um, uh, are, are appropriate for this type of aging. And in a way, I, you know, I always compare wines with people. Um, and in this case, you know, we would be talking about children. And I think it's fair to say that often these wines choose themselves. They have they, the characteristics are there. Uh, it's a bit like children, you know, um, some are good at art and some are good at science and what have you. And uh, so to speak. <laughs> so we've got another question here. Why is the 1990? called the Lodge Edition. Um, so the reason why they called it the Lodge Edition was 1990 was 100 years anniversary since the 1890 uh, Lodge was built. And in fact, part of the, um, the tube that the, the 1990 comes in has um, the, the, wood, the wooden base is actually made from the original staves that, that held the, um, the, the uh, Port Lodge up. Uh, Charles, I've got one for you here. Do you ever deliberately store the wine in higher or lower humidity to decelerate or accelerate the evaporation to affect the wine characteristics over the aging period? No, no. Um, we, we actually, we're very much left in nature's hands. I think, um, fortunately, I think the in, in the end, the style of many of these wines has been created historically through the locations in which they are aged. The, the, the lodge, the the eighteen ninety lodge, um, it is a location where we've been aging wines um, since then, and, and previous to that, obviously, there would have been somewhere else here in Gaia. I can't tell you where that would have been, but it would have been probably quite close to where the existing lodge is. And um, so, the let's say the variation in the in the humidity and the um, and the climate here in Port would would determine. The style of the wine to an extent, um, but never forgetting that because we're we're alongside the sea, uh, we're right on the coast here. The, the humidity levels are quite high, and the temperatures do not fluctuate very much. The the sea does have very much a cushioning effect on on maximum and minimum temperatures, and obviously creates quite high levels of humidity uh, locally. Yeah. So we've got another question asking about the colour of the tube of 1974 from Hans. So the colour of the tubes will, will be um, orange. Um, Charles, we've got a question about where the brandy comes from, from Tom. Right. Um, well, the brandy, we sourced uh, the majority of our brandy here in Portugal um, from distillers who, who produce brandy. Um, but it can also be sourced um, in Spain. Uh, Spain is one of the largest producers of brandy in Europe, so uh, again, they, they have a large tradition of producing brandy, but the large majority we can be sourced, we will be sourcing here, and, um, and the brandy is a, um, we, we look for brandies to be fairly inert to, to an extent, we're not looking, we're not making, you know, um, we're not making uh, sort of flavoured drinks, we're, we're making the wine to be representative of the terroir where it comes from in the Dura Valley, and therefore the the, the brandy should be uh, vinous, but with, without much impact on the overall flavour of the grapes that the wine was made from. Um, and what leads you to select uh, a, a particular year for for creator or single harvest release? Well, what leads you to select the in a particular year? What are the what are the main reasons that um, we 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 select the the years for creative release? Well, we we will um, we will always hold back some wine from nearly every year uh, for for this type of aging. So we'll, 
obviously some will age better than others over time um, but um, in most years we'll, we'll have wines which are um, of a quality appropriate for, for this type of aging so um, you know it might be more of a question of how much we keep of the different of different years rather than which ones. Do we source the majority of our grapes from uh, for, for single harvest tawnies or, or for tawny uh, from Quinta dos Malverdos? Yeah, most of the most of the top quality wines that are being produced by Graham are from Malverdos and now from Quinta do Dua. Uh, so yes, I mean basically we have a much better control over the way we produce it from our in our own vineyards and, and, and even the, the vinification itself. Yeah. So one of the things actually I didn't mention earlier, which I'll just throw in now, is that um, creator wines have another advantage in terms of the consumer, I think, is that we, we can offer one of these creators now, so it's bottled, ready for drinking today, um, of a wine that we've seen in the cellar is showing particularly well at this moment in time. But um, wines, again, are a bit like people, and they go through phases, and they can have better phases and not such good phases. Um, so we, we bottle these wines when they're showing well. And when they start sometimes dipping into a less interesting phase, we'll stop. And then often they'll come back again, or they will almost for certain come back and shine again in a few years' time. And so we will then bottle them once again but, uh, when, when they are showing at their best, which is a great advantage when you buy a wine like this. You know that you're buying it um, at the best time to drink. We've got a, a, a bit of a broader question here. Um, will climate change affect the port industry and what is its effect on the dairy? Well, it's, um, it's a very question and I think in fairness, it, it is very likely to do so um, as it will the whole world. <laughs> so we're not obviously um, exempt from that problem. I think um, the we have an advantage in so much that I think we have very uh, tough varieties. Our varieties are have been uh, sort of uh, selected over many years uh, for a climate which is it's not an easy climate. They're very resistant to to water, drought, and and, um, and high peaks of temperature. But obviously, there's a limit to everything that um, that can be thrown at us. But uh, we are trying to adapt our viticulture. We are looking at other varieties. Um, we are basically trying to mitigate as far as possible the effects of climate change. But there, there is no doubt that uh, we are starting to feel uh, that things that are, are changing. And one of the things that's clearly changed, um, and is interesting in fact to note, is that we have, um, we have harvest reports um, back to the 1880s. And um, if you go back and read these harvest reports, what is clear is that the harvest um, the harvest 50, 60, 70 years ago would have been in mid-October um, and sometimes as late as end of October. Uh, I think some harvests, in fact, made it into the beginning of November. Um, we, we are now harvesting in the mid-September period um, and sometimes as early as the beginning of September. So clearly, you know, the, the, the cycle has changed. Um, we, are, we are experiencing clearly unusual circumstances. We had a vintage start uh, in August um, recently. So um, it, it, is, it is concerning and I think we all have to do what we can to try and invert this situation. What, what varieties do you see us using more of in the future and, and less of in the future um, given, given current climate change? Yeah, I think one of the one of the casualties of this um, of these conditions is, is looking to be Barocca. The Tinka Barocca is a variety that was um, already very early ripening, and the conditions seem to be making it extremely difficult to to work with this variety. The, it tends to dehydrate; it's more sensitive in that respect, and I think um, is a variety that uh, that um, that we'll probably see less of in the future. Uh, having said that, we've introduced uh, Alicante, which is a variety that's always been present in the Dura. It's one of the authorised varieties for port, uh, but it's a variety that does seem to be very resistant um, and, and a very good quality variety as well. So um, we are finding alternatives, but uh, things are definitely changing. 
Perfect. Right, guys, we've, we've come to the end of our session. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining tonight. I hope everyone's enjoyed the tasting. Uh, I, I certainly have. It's been really interesting to hear from Charles, our head winemaker. So thank you, Charles, um, for telling us about these wines. Uh, I hope we've converted everybody um, to be Graham's Port Tawny lovers. Um, and hopefully as we come out of COVID and the restrictions uh, um, decrease and uh, we can enjoy life a little bit more, we can, we can all have a nice uh, tawny bottle in the fridge uh, to enjoy with friends and special moments or even just to wind down at the end of a, a long day. So um, thanks very much. And um, uh, yeah, all the best from Graham's Port. Uh, cheers. Cheers. Thank you for joining us. All the best.